All right. Um, so let's let's read to start with. We're just going to read this chapter uh, straight through. So uh, you have uh, verses one through four. You would start, and we'll read all the way to the end of the chapter. The false proverb the The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, "What do you mean when you shall use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying?" The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father, as well as the soul of the son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, and covers the naked with a garment, does not land at interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully, he is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. But if that man has a son who is a robber or murderer and who fulfills none of his responsibilities, who refuses to obey the laws of God but worships idols on the mountains and commits adultery, and oppresses the poor and needy, and robs his debtors by refusing to let them redeem what they have given him in pledge, and loves idols and worships them, and loans out his money at interest. Shall that man live? No, he shall surely die, and it is his own fault. Uh, verse 14, but suppose a son has a son who sees all the sins of his father, Commit, and though he sees him, he does not do such things. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look to the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone or require a pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery, but gives his food to the hungry and provides clothing for the naked. He withholds his hand from mistreating the poor and takes no interest or profit from them. He keeps my laws and follows my decrees. He will not die for his father's sin. He will surely live. But his father will die for his own sin because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was wrong among his people. Did you ask, why does the son not share the guilt of his father? Since a son has done what is just and right and has been careful to keep all of my decrees, he will surely live. The one who sins is the one who will die. Did I skip something? <laughs> the child will not share the guilt of his parent, nor will a parent share, share the guilt of the child. The righteous righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. Ready? 21 Yeah, 21 notes. But if the wicked turn away from the sins they have committed and keep my decrees and do what is just and right, they will surely live. They will not die. None of the offenses has, he has committed will be remembered against him. Because of the righteous things he has done, he will live. Do I take pleasure in the death of the wickedness? Wicked declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, I am not pleased when they turn from their ways and live. If, the, if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness he is he is guilty of and because of the sins he has committed he will die yet you say the way of the lord is not right hear now o house of israel 
Is my way not right? Is it not your ways that are not right? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies because of it, for his iniquity, iniquity which he has committed, he will die. Again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness, which he has committed, and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all his transgression, transgressions, which he had committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. But the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not right. Are my ways not right, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways? that are not right? Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone the sovereign Lord, repent and live. All right, thank you very much. Um, question one says, many commentators speak of this chapter as being particularly important of the, all the chapters in the book of Ezekiel. And this one is especially important. One of those commentators said, theologically, this chapter must rank as one of the most important in the book. What do you see in the chapter? that might cause them to think that. What is there here that would make them say, this is a really important chapter in the book of Ezekiel? It has to do with salvation and who's going to receive that. Okay, yep. And who will not. Yep, so very foundational that way, talking about who's going to be saved and who's not and why. <clears throat> yep, very definitely. Any other things that you see that you say this is what makes this important. Each man is responsible for themselves. Yeah. You yes. can't depend on your parents or, <laughs> yeah, it's each person is responsible for their decision. Yeah. And, and that is one of the things that they really focus on, um, you know, that it's, you know, it's all about that, your individual standing with God. Um, and part of the reason that that scene is important is, you know, Ezekiel's been talking about the nation of Israel being judged for their national sins. You know, the whole nation is going to experience this. And, and throughout the Old Testament, there's an emphasis on that kind of the, the community understanding of spiritual life. You know, everybody affects everybody else and you know the people of Israel and God's people especially were united together and so you know there was a sense that you know community is really important in our relationship with God but this chapter reminds us yes that's true but when it comes down to you know, who is going to have eternal life and who's not, every individual is going to stand by themselves before God. Um, and so that emphasis comes through strongly. Anything else that you see in this chapter that's like, yeah, that really emphasizes why this is an important chapter. The last yes. uh, three words, repent and live. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's so many people that say, how can God send people to hell? And, and you know, how can he? Mm -hmm. And it says, you know, he says he doesn't, he, he hates to see people yes. die. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. That isn't, he doesn't find pleasure in that. Yeah. And so that, that emphasis that God wants everyone to be mm -hmm. saved, that's his mm -hmm. desire. You know, he's not sitting up in heaven, you know, boy, who can I get today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's not how we should understand who he is. And especially, you know, sometimes people picture, you know, the God of the Old Testament as a God of wrath. You know, that's what he was like back then. And now, you know, Jesus is different than that God of the Old Testament. And this is a chapter yeah. that says, no, God has always been the same. 
You know, what we see in Jesus is who God is. And, and this reminds us, God doesn't want people to go to hell. He, he doesn't take pleasure in that. Um, and that really hand, comes through. Satan does. Yes. Yeah. And yet people yeah. fall on Satan. Yeah. So let's look at how some of this works out in the chapter. Um, he starts out in verse 2 by repeating a proverb. Um, Ezekiel has mentioned Proverbs before. Um, in chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, there were a couple of Proverbs about the prophets. In ch chapter 16, verse 44, it quoted the proverb, like mother, like daughter. Yeah. Um, and then in chapter 17, it talked about that parable of the two great eagles. And that is the same word as used here for proverb. Um, in this context. And then just to notice, uh, the implication is you keep repeating, you know, that's the phrase there, you keep repeating this proverb. And, and so the implication is, this was a very popular thing for people to say about their circumstance and their situation. You know, it wasn't just one person said this, but this was very very prominent in the culture. And um, a, another reason we know this is this proverb exactly is quoted in Jeremiah 31 verse 29, who was living the same time as Ezekiel, he was just back in Israel. Um, and he quotes the same proverb that people are saying. Um, and so just to recognize that, uh, so he begins with this proverb, question two says, what is the meaning of the proverb? In verse 2, and how is it being applied among the people of Israel in Ezekiel today? What would you say? What is the point of that proverb? Uh, <clears throat> I paraphrased it said the children are punished for their fathers. Okay. Sins. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on head. What does that mean? I don't get that. Well, if you eat a sour grape, what happens in your mouth? Yeah, and, and that's the way they described it. Their teeth are set on edge. But the proverb was, the father eats the sour grape, and the child's teeth are set on edge. And so that paraphrase catches the idea. They're saying, God, you're punishing the children for the father's sins, and it's not fair. Notice they aren't questioning sin deserves punishment. Now, people sin, they should be punished. And they aren't questioning the fact that sin is being punished in this context. They're just saying, God, you're punishing the wrong people for these sins. You're messing up, God. Um, and most likely, in their minds, the the kind of thing they would have had in mind would have been the sins of King Manasseh of Judah, who reigned about 50 years before this was written, who was probably the worst, most evil king of Judah over the whole course of its history. He was the one that is especially noted for promoting the child sacrifice that happened. And so, you know, the people were looking at their situation, you know, they've been defeated by Babylon, much of them carried off into exile, in a very precarious situation. It's like, yep, God is punishing Israel. He's punishing us for what Manasseh did. You know, he was so bad, God has to punish that sin, but he's punishing us for Manasseh's sin. Um, what's the real problem here? You know, they are saying, God, you're punishing the wrong people. They don't see their own sin. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they deserve punishment. Yeah. Everybody does. Yeah, they didn't have any problem recognizing the sin of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those guys were bad. <laughs> you know, they were terrible. But God, why are you punishing us? You know? And, and that would they had trouble admitting taking responsibility for their own sin. 
Um, what about the last part of that question? Does this describe how people in our day think about God? Do you think that goes on at all? You know, God, you're punishing the wrong people. You know, those people back there in history were bad. Why are you punishing us? Is, is that something that we see in here in our culture today? No, it might be, but I don't sense it's a majority of people. That feel like yeah, it, it probably doesn't feel like, you know, this is a huge issue in our day. Are there, are there ways that we see it today? Is there anything that comes to mind? Where you see this kind of thing in our in our day, in our culture, you might want to uh, look at it like reparations. Okay. So if you have a previous generation did something, then following yes. generations, have yes, pay reparations. Yeah. For that. Yeah. And so that's one of the ways we're seeing in our culture today. We should be giving African Americans money to pay for our ancestors' sins of slavery. You know that. It's this picture for sure. It's not quite the same thing, but you know that kind of, where you know the the children are responsible for their father's sins is the idea. Any any other things that come to your mind? You know, I, I think about you know you can make a comparison with critical race theory. Yeah, you know, you well, no, that's a little uh -huh. different. You know, critical race theory says, you know, because I was born a white male in the upper Midwest, I am guilty for being an oppressor in our culture and society today. Just by my birth, you know, my ancestry, I am guilty. Um, and so, you know, this kind of thing is out there. In our culture today. Um, and so just to recognize that reality. So they are quoting this proverb, God, you're punishing the wrong people. How does God respond to their use of this proverb as we look at verses three and four? Stop saying this. Okay. No. And, and we, we need to recognize that this is not just God saying, stop saying this. Like setting out an arbitrary rule. You know, God is saying, you're going to stop oh, saying okay. this because you're going to realize it's false. You know, it's not, I'm going to make you stop saying this no matter what you really believe in your heart. He's saying, you're going to come to realize what you're saying is wrong. And so you're not going to say the proverb anymore. And so basically his response is, response is, this kind of thinking is going to be shown to be false. So can we apply that today then? To the <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that something that we can it, actually... It will be shown to be false. Yeah. Ultimately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know that we can predict yeah. when yeah. that's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, the principle is there that, you know, what does God say is true about every individual as you look at the end of verse four? Everyone belongs to God. To yeah. Me. Yeah. And so God is the God, God is God. We, we can't really question him and who he is and what he's done. He is God. And then what does he go on to say in verse 5? Whoever is, whoever is responsible for the sin will die. Yes. And so he says, the proverb is false. Every individual is going to be judged for their own sins, not for the sins of their ancestors. So he starts out by just saying, you know, the proverb is false. You guys aren't suffering for your parents' sins. You're suffering for your sins. You know, that's what you're being punished for. So then, question four. God lays out his case using a series of case studies in verses 5 through 18. Um, these case studies in divine justice. So, first of all, who are the three characters involved? Excuse me, in these three case studies. 
Who is the first character in verses five through nine? Righteous man. Okay, so there's first a righteous man, and then we'll get to verse 10. Who is the person that's in focus? Righteous son. So the righteous man has a son who is unrighteous. So that's the second one. And then in verses 14 through 18, who is in the focus? The son of the Bible. Son. Yeah. So the guy, first guy's grandson. You know, so we got the father and the son, and then his son after him. So as we look at the criteria that God sets out here. How do you and I fare with regard to that criteria as to whether we deserve death or not? God says, I'm going to judge every individual based on their action. How do we do? We all have to fall short. We, we all sin. Yeah, we yeah. all die. It's part of our nature. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that is the point that we should get. You know, look at the beginning, of, or look at verse 5. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, and then he finishes that statement at the end of verse 9. If he is righteous and does what is just and right, he is righteous and he shall surely live. So that's the standard. And the standard is God's righteousness, not any human standard of righteousness. And there's no grading on a curve you know, this is it. You know, you do this and you live. If you don't do it, you die. That's it. That's all there is to it. And, you know, the reality is, you know, Paul says in Romans 3 verse 10, quoting the Old Testament, there is none righteous, no, not one. You know, and this is looking at not just my action, but my thoughts, my motivations, my desires, my intentions, my words. And it's not just, you know, well, sometimes I can do pretty good. This is all the time in every situation. The standard is we need to be righteous in God's sight. And so, you know, everybody is in trouble if we apply that standard strictly. So we're going to see where that goes, but first look at question five, and I'm interested in your response to this. As you look at the list of sins in verses six through nine, and they're repeated pretty much very similarly in each of the three case studies, but you can just look at verses six through nine. That's the most comprehensive list. Are there questions that come to mind, comments to make? Um, what kinds? What are the kinds of behavior and character qualities listed in these verses tell us about what's important from God's perspective? As you look at that list of sins, what are the things that come to your mind? Are there questions that these things raise? Are there comments that you make? I always think sometimes when we look at sin as humans, we we sort of categorize, you know, like this one's really really bad, this yeah. one's not so bad. Yeah. But to God, they're all the same. Yeah. And that's why we, it's so important that we repent on a daily basis yeah. and ask for forgiveness and then trust in Jesus' blood to cover it. Yeah. Because he, like you said, it's not just the things we do, it's the things we think. And yeah. Ugh, yeah. <laughs> don't say and don't say. And, yeah. and that is one of the things I think that is intended by the list is there's quite a wide variety of sins that are listed. And like you say, some of them are like, oh, you know, but others of them are really bad. <laughs> and God just has this list that, you know, this is the kind of thing we're dealing with here. And so we can't just cap, we can't categorize it and say, well, I, am, I don't do really bad stuff. You know, that list helps us see that. Other things that you see looking at that list. Well, there's no self-interest whatsoever in the list. Mm -hmm. It is completely outward looking. Mm -hmm. It's yep. taking care of others. It's it's uh, you know doing all these things in a way that you get no return for it mm -hmm. whatsoever. So yep. it's very altruistic. Yes. And uh, yep. and, and especially uh, the way the world works, it's just it's not the way the world works. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So a big part of this is care for the weaker members of the community. 
know, people who can't repay you, who, you know, really need help. And it's hard to help, you know, but we're called to care for them, to demonstrate love. Um, and, and that really comes through in this list, very definitely. It really, I know, we talk about charging interest in our loan back they Jews were looked down upon because apparently they were the only bankers in charge interest. I don't know about the history of it all, but mine says excessive. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, or profit, I think, is what Joe's Bible said. Is that maybe that's down farther, though? Well, it, that, it's that similar history? statements are repeated all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. It does not lend at usury. Is that that one? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Or take excessive yep. interest. Or yeah. Profit. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, I mean, as you look at this, you know, as it's literally written, the question comes to mind, is banking wrong? You know, because that's what it's based on is, mm -hmm. you know, you got to charge interest if you're going to mm -hmm. have a bank. Pay for the bank. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so yeah. what do we do with this? It's How do we understand that? Excessive interest. Right. Okay. So and most, most yeah. translations go that route okay. that, you know, that must be what God is referring to. Mm -hmm. Not charging any interest, but the interest that's excessive or unfair or applied in a way that is meant to hurt yeah. the people. Like a loan shark or something. Yes, or yes, yeah. very definitely. And that this is about a man and what he does, mm -hmm. the business does. So, mm -hmm. yes, kind of a distinction. Yes, and that's another distinction that's made up is you know one of the one of the commentators said you know this being personal is very a very different thing from the modern money lending practices of a commercial bank you know this is talking about an individual who has somebody come to him and say you know i really need some help here can you help me you know could you give me a loan and the guy says sure i feel sorry for you i'll give you a loan but what are the terms of that personal loan? You know, you know, that's the kind of thing that's especially in focus here. Yeah. I had a question here. He does not eat at the mountain shrines mm -hmm. or look to the idols of the house of Israel. So is that for the shrines, like heathen shrines or something at the mountain? It's back then. It the yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, the so high places. Okay, the high places. Yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. it's a little different language yeah. used here, mm -hmm. but that is what it has in mind. Yeah. And, you know, Mostly, most likely looking at, you know, sitting down to a meal that's part of that sacrificial okay. event mm -hmm. at these high places, okay. worshiping an idol. Yeah. I wonder if that's why in Paul's time, there were groups of people that didn't want to have anything to do with the, the food, yes. sacrifice, yeah. idols, and yeah. others, you know. Yeah, yeah. That was a controversy in part because of that history. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have that long list of uh, sins and those three case studies. Um, but then looking at question six, how does Ezekiel answer the question in verses 19 and 20? Uh, the ESV words the question this way. Why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? Or the NIV has, why does the son not share in the guilt of his father? How do we understand that question? You know, in my reading through this, to start with, it's like, what are they talking about there? Is it, you know, what, what's the point of that question? So as you look at this, you know, what comes to your mind? And how does Ezekiel answer that question that's asked in that verse? Well, you have to look at each individual heart, the heart of the mm -hmm. father, the heart of the son. It sounds yes. like the son is doing what's right in front of the father. Yes. And while he's trying to, I mean, he yeah. can't be perfect, but his heart is yeah. turned towards God. Yes. Son. And so, again, you know, the, the way that this is put together, it's like he's restating his point. You know, they're asking again, you know, what about this ancestral blame for sin? 
And he again says, no, it's every individual that is responsible for their own sin. The, the thing that it seems like that question is doing, why that question is there, is it's, it's making the point that the people aren't really listening or understanding what God is saying to them. You know, they're, they're quoting this proverb, God gives Ezekiel this message, nope, I'm not punishing the wrong person, it's every individual, you're being punished for your sin, and it's like they ask the same question again when they get to verse 17. <laughs> and Ezekiel's like, no, nope. you know, it's your sin that you're being punished for. But somewhere way back when, there's that verse where God said that he would punish into the like third and fourth generation or whatever it was. Yeah, so that must have been what they're confused about. That's question eight. Oh, I should know that. I that. <laughs> <laughs> that is a huge point that is raised by this passage. You know, it really is, and it should come to our minds. You know, what about what about that? I don't understand that. And and that was part of why they were struggling with this issue. It's they were probably thinking back to that. Sure teaching from the book of Exodus. Well, plus they were taught this proverb, right? I mean, that was... Yeah. This I mean, they're thinking, well, and, this is what we're taught. Yeah, and, yeah. and we know this yeah. whole scoop because we have the whole Bible and the New Testament. Yeah. But, but wasn't that a, a saying they developed themselves? Well, the proverb, they, okay, yeah. but, you know, those teachings yeah. were yeah. in their background yeah. when they developed that. Okay. And so, you know, just to recognize... You know, part of what Ezekiel God is saying here is that he, he's just making the point they they don't want to recognize their own sin and their own blame for their sin. And so they keep coming up with questions, basically accusing God of injustice rather than taking responsibility for what they've done. And, and so that seems like the point of what he's doing is, you know, just as like, you know, they're just coming up with the same question that they'd already asked because they don't want to deal with the reality of their own sin. So part of the answer to this is question seven. What phrase begins Ezekiel 18, 19, 25, and 29? And what does that tell us about the reason people were objecting to what God was doing? How, do, how does that, each of those verses start? At least in the ESV, it says, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yet you say yeah. is the phrase that's used at the beginning of each of those verses. And so how does that, you know, what does that tell us about why they were objecting in this way? That Ezekiel says to them, yet you say, yet you say, yet you say. They're just stuck on what is in their heads. Yes. They just and, it, and it's their thinking, their teaching, their knowledge that they're basing this on. Not what does God say, not what does the Bible say, not what was actually written in the law, but what do you say? And that's a, that's a challenge for us. You know, what do we base our understanding? of who God is and how God works and what he does. You know, where do we get that from? And we need to be really careful that, you know, my understanding of God and, and his teaching is based on his word, not on what I've heard. You know, what we've heard may be great and helpful and good, but we have to make sure it's based on what does God say in his word. And, and these phrases remind us that was the problem. They weren't going back to what God said. They were just going by what we're hearing in our culture. Tradition. Yes. Yeah. Could we, you know, as people, we think of important things, let's say wealth and power and prestige. Mm -hmm. And so those, those things are certainly natural consequences of our parents. Yeah. So let's yeah. say they lost all their money, they squandered it, mm -hmm. they yeah. didn't do well, and 
because of that, we didn't get a good education. Yep. A lot of other things happened. Yep. So we think we're being punished, but that's not God's standard. That's right. not what he looks at. Right. He looks at these other things. Yeah, yeah. And that really gets to question eight, then. How can we understand the teaching in Ezekiel 18, 1 through 20 in relation to the words from the law in Exodus 25 and 6? I am, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation, those who hate me, showing steadfast love to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. And the question is, doesn't Exodus teach that children are punished for their parents' sin? What do we do with this? How do we understand this? You have to read this real carefully mm -hmm. where it says, the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generation, key phrase, of those who hate me. I think that's the key is, might be the third and fourth generation, but do they hate me and disobey? Or do they show steadfast love? So I, I think that's the key there. Yeah. And a lot of times when we think of that passage of scripture, all that we remember is it says God punishes the children to the third and fourth generation. Yeah. We're like, well, God, I'm not sure about that one. You know, really? Uh, but it, it doesn't stop there. You know, God doesn't punish the children to the third and fourth generation randomly or, you know, just arbitrarily. It's, you know, the father rejects God and rebels against him and does evil. And his son rebels against God sure. and rejects God's teaching and does evil. And God punishes the children, you know, and they experience some of the consequences of their father's sin. But the child is in rebellion against God. That's why they're punished. And their child, who also rebels against God and doesn't follow God's law, he's punished. He's the third generation. But it's because he hates God, not because of his father's sin. And so that is, you know, that phrase we often forget about when we talk about that passage. And it's it's a it, all those rebellious generations are the consequence mm -hmm. of a family who goes that direction. It just spirals mm -hmm. downward, downward, yeah. downward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to recognize that, you know, really the point of that passage in Exodus is to warn the parents and say, you guys need to pay attention to this and straighten up because your children are going to be affected by how you live mm -hmm. and your relationship with God. They are. Mm -hmm. And so don't mess this up because there are consequences to what you do and how you act and what you say. And, you know, so that's the point of the passage. It is to say there are things that are carried down from one generation to the other. So parents, make sure that you don't do this. But the point isn't that third generation child gets punished for their parents' sin. You know, that's not the point of and that's what the people of Israel were doing in Ezekiel 6. After we we had services at Faith Haven, um, we had dismissed the kids. And this one kid was sitting in the front row just bawling his eyes out. And I went and sat next to him. And I said, Jamie, what's wrong? He says, I hate my dad. Mm -hmm. I absolutely hate my dad. And I just want to die. Mm -hmm. He said, everybody tells me that I'm just like my dad. Oh. Oh. And if I'm going to be just like him, I want to be oh. dead. Oh. And, and this, yeah. <laughs> this is where this verse, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but I told him, I said, Jamie, I said, because of Christ, mm -hmm. we yes. don't have to be like our parents. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he yeah. can save us from that. Yes. And that's such an yeah. amazing thing when a when a child breaks that cycle yeah. and turns it around yeah. and yeah. Um, wow 
I told him, I said, Jamie, you're probably not ever going to be able to drink at all. Right, right, I right. said, you probably do have yeah. the tendency to yeah. become an yeah. alcoholic yeah. like your dad. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, yeah. don't go there. just don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. But, and, but, and that is, a, you know, that is an example of, you know, children do experience the consequences of their parents. Right. right. You know, and, and some of it is not through any fault of their own. I mean, some of it's right. DNA. Right. You know, we inherit stuff from our, our parents, tendencies, and, and so on. Right. You know, those things are realities. You know, the point that God is making in His Word is you know that that's the case. And so you need to be very careful about mm -hmm. what you do and how you live and the choices you make because it's not just you that's right. being affected. It's all these people around you, especially your family. And so, according, <coughs> and then, like you say, that the end of that verse is intended to be just amazing gospel. You know, God says that the children suffer to the third and fourth generation, those who hate him. But then he says, but I show steadfast love not to the third and fourth generation, but to thousands. Yeah. You know, and, and if people hear that gospel and know God's steadfast love and there's repentance and change, you know, God is ready to bring about that change. And bring about, you know, their experience in his steadfast love to thousands. So, you know, that's the other side of the coin that we need to keep in mind, too. It was it was interesting that when the ambassadors were here, we took them out for lunch that Sunday. Mm -hmm. And just visiting with them and, okay, where do you live? Who are your parents? And four of the six kids we could trace their relatives back to my home church and my home parish. They were great grandchildren of people that grew up in my church. And it actually, it, I don't know how many, cause it was, it was probably great, great grandchildren. If you go back yeah, to Ivor and Arnie's parents. Yeah, I'm not sure. yeah. It was just so funny realizing that, that, you know, those youth groups and those church services and those Bible camps that parents had sent their kids to was still showing fruits. It was just crazy. The other thing about that Exodus passage that maybe is helpful to understand is God's statement to the third and fourth generation probably in that culture would have resonated in terms of there were multiple generations living in a home. Yeah. And so yeah. God spoke that word to the great granddad who is child and grandchild and great grandchild were living with him and said, your actions are going to affect for the third and fourth generation. They were right there at the moment and experiencing that. So that puts a little different picture on that uh, teaching as well. So question nine, what do you see in chapter 18 verses 21 to 29 that adds something more to the teaching of this chapter at this point? Kind of a longer section after those case studies and there's some kind of new things that are thrown in here in that section. What do you see that adds some more that hadn't been there in, in verses 1 to 20 that hadn't been covered up to that point? Forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. The, the gospel really is in that last section. You know, it's not just about law. <laughs> and consequences of sin, but there is the potential for change and renewal. Are there other things that you see that are, you know, something a little different, a little more that's added at this point? Hmm. 
you know, up to this point, it's been, you know, here's this man who was righteous. He lived a righteous life and, you know, received God's blessing. Here's this man who was wicked, he lived a wicked life, received God's judgment. Here's this man who's righteous, lived a righteous life, he received God's blessing. Well, it, kind of, uh, it talks about different phases. Okay. You were righteous, yes. you went bad. You yes. were bad, you went righteous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, so a, it's a little different transition. picture there. That's yeah. not just everybody is one way all the way through their whole life. Right. And so what does God do with the person who has been wicked all his life? And then at the end, repents. What does God do with that person? You know, because he was wicked all his life. It's your most recent behavior. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and you know, that puts a little different picture on this. Yeah, you know, 30, 31. Oh, we aren't going to 30. That's okay. Right? Yeah. They get a new heart and a new okay. spirit. You know, I'll take yeah. the heart of stone yeah. and, you know, make yeah. the heart of flesh. Yeah. Yeah. But I just noticed throughout the passage, you know, if you give up all your, you know, it's using all a lot, which mm -hmm. we can't do, but I mean, yeah. our heart is there to yeah. want to do it, but yeah, it's Jesus that yes. protects us. Yeah. And, and that is another kind of a side note in this section that we need to make sure we get clear, you know, like at the end of verse 22, it says, for the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Is that teaching works righteousness, that we're saved on the basis of our good works? We say, but I can see no. people would take it that way. Right, you know? and so what do we do yeah. with that? And we, and we need to compare scripture with scripture mm -hmm. right. exactly. and recognize, you know, this is in the first place, reminding us, the only one that is righteous and has done righteousness so that they deserve to live is Jesus. And so our only hope of righteousness in that sense is faith in Christ. You know, and so that aspect of it. But then, you know, the other side of it that probably this is focused on more is the person who has received that salvation and forgiveness and the righteousness of Christ, then wants to live in a way that pleases God. And there's fruit of that faith that's shown in their life. And so, you know, it's, it's recognizing that a life in Christ will change. It'll be different than that wickedness that was demonstrated all the way before. And so, yeah, but it's a challenging statement and it's good to recognize that. When it talks about live and die here, mm -hmm. does that mean live eternally? Are they talking about that with Christ and not die? Yes. I, I think that is eternal too. Yes. Yes. And so ultimately those statements are, I think, applying to eternity and eternal life and eternal death. You know, there's there's some truth to, you know, if we follow God's will and God's plan, we have a lot better chance of living a good, nice, healthy, prosperous life, you know, because that's how we're meant to live. God designed us that way. And so there are blessings in this life as well. But really, when it gets down to it, it's focused on eternity, the ultimate living and death. Yes. And you know, this would be an awfully frustrating thing if you were uh, someone living in that time and it said exactly what Diane was talking about. Mm -hmm. You have to turn away all, mm -hmm. put the wicked parts away from all his sins mm -hmm. he has committed yep. and keeps all my statutes yep. Yep. and yep. does what is, I mean, it's kind of like possible. Yeah, totally and, and I'm being told that by Ezekiel and say, I've got to get pretty depressed, quite frankly. <laughs> and that's why they set up the sacrifice. Yeah. The system of sacrifice yeah. because they knew God knew and, yeah. and and that last statement repent mm -hmm. and live. Mm -hmm. You know, and so what's required of us is to recognize right. our sin, right. to admit, yep, yeah, God, I messed up. I deserve every bit of punishment that you're giving me and more. I can't change. You know, I can't make this right. My only hope is your forgiveness and your grace. You know, 
please forgive me for my sin and give me that righteousness that is yours. And so that's all implied in that repent and live. You know, this is this is law. That's what it is. So that's and why these Pharisees are running around saying, you got to do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and they missed the point. The point wasn't, let's get this right now. The point was, I can't get this right. You know, I can't do this. I need God's grace. That's my only hope. And, and that's where, you know, this chapter, even though it's so much law, you know, is intended to get us in the end. You know, I don't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. Repent and live. That's what I want, is I want you to live. Um, but it, it was hard for them to hear that message. Um, and so that's question 10. What does the Lord call the people to do? For what reason? calls them to repent and to live. What makes repentance a desirable alternative? Eternal life. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's pretty yeah, good. Evil, which is yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And then question 11 says, what evidence for chapter 18, verse 32 can be found in the Bible? Are there things that come to your mind? God says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Where do we see that worked out in practice in the Bible? There, are there things that come to your mind where God says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone? We'll rejoice in the, uh, in the presence of the angels of God when a sinner repents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that passage in Luke 15. Mm -hmm. You know, how does God feel about sinners? Yeah. When one of them <laughs> repents, mm -hmm. there's a huge party that happens in heaven. You know, God doesn't take pleasure in people going to hell. What God takes pleasure in it is saving people from going to heaven. Anything else that comes to your mind? Examples? I think from Scripture. Very patient with us. Yes. And it's because he desires that all should be saved. It says yeah. In the Bible. So. Yeah. He gives people a lot of time. He gives them yeah. a lot of chances. Yeah. Because he doesn't want people to end up in hell. Yeah. Even, you know, when he said that to the thief on the cross, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those after the one lost sheep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just the one lost sheep. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, very interesting chapter in Ezekiel. Very different. Kind of, but I just had a question, too. Yeah. Did they real? I know they were waiting for a savior, you know, a messiah that was mm -hmm. included before this. Did they have any concept he came to uh, free them from their sin rather than from oppression by the Romans? Or did they have any concept that that's what the savior is going to do? Or did they always think they had to measure up and, I suppose, offer sacrifices? They were told to do that. I think it's hard for us to know for sure what their thoughts would have been like at the time of Ezekiel. Yeah. You know, we know by the time of Jesus, the great majority of people were looking for a political, physical deliverer. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Okay. But, you know, you still have people like, like Joseph and Mary, who, you know, when the angel told them, you know, you're going to have the Messiah, you're going to raise the house. Mm -hmm. They believed them. And, you know, they didn't, you know, well, we got to give them sword training. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, they, you know, they were just That's humble true. people yeah. who raised their son. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you know, you think about Anna in the temple when Jesus was born and Simeon. Yeah. You know, so there were people who, you know, they didn't grasp the whole picture, but it wasn't. You know, just that military political thing that, that was being looked for. Yeah. You think so, if Jesus wore nicer clothes <laughs> than he was on law. <laughs> well, you know, they're used biggest? to kings with purple right. and you know, right. all yeah. decked out. Um, you know, he did not look at the part. Right. He didn't. You know, everything about him yeah. was humble. Yeah. 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 
and they just they should they have gotten it. Hard yeah. Time. But you know, they, you know, the the reality is the the whole sacrificial system was intended to, you know, God is saying, this is what you need. Yeah. And, right. you know, the one who's coming, that's what they're going to bring. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they should have gotten that, yeah. but it got twisted mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. And so, you know, this, God, you know, this thing, though, 18 is one of the big frustrations of Martin Luther. You know, he was trying to repent all the time. Yes. Yeah. He was going crazy. Yes. And he couldn't eat you know, himself yeah. up. I just, yeah. And I, I just can't get this right. Yeah. You know, I. Yeah. I, and, yeah. and that's why I'm thinking, you know, if someone really takes this to heart, literally, you know, we'll, it's just, we can't get there. Yeah. Know? And that's yeah. why I've been really frustrated. It is. Yeah. It's depressing. Oh, oh Jesus. Yes. 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 Yeah. And that's why he gave us the whole right. Yeah. The yeah. whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So we're, so we're to have it all. Well, let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news. Lord, I just thank you so much for this picture that says so so strongly that you do not take pleasure in the death of anyone, that you want all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of. Thank you for your grace to us, for bringing that gospel to us, and Lord, help us to want to bring that gospel to people around us. Help us to be honest and to recognize that we're just like those people in Ezekiel's day, that we sometimes struggle to acknowledge our own sin. Um, we want to blame others. Lord, help us to be honest, to recognize our need, but Lord, thank you for the grace of, of Christ. Lord, be with us as we go from here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, the next session.